good. I'm Lee, how are you? Good morning. I am very well and you. <laughs> since uh, since uh, I, 24 hours. I, <laughs> I enjoyed your talk two days ago. It was fun. Thank you. Uh, the quality of was good. Bypass. I'm Dr. Zhongtao Zhang, 
Vice President of Beijing Friendship Hospital uh, and the Chair of uh, Gender Surgery. It is my honor to co-chair this, uh, this webinar with Professor Antonio Torres, Professor of Surgery at uh, Complutense University of Madrid, former President of uh, IFSO. I also thank Professor Safadi, uh, Dabri, Charles Zhang, Hui Liang, Hao Jiang, uh, Nangwei Zhang, Wei Liu, and uh, Yang Liu to join us in this event. Today's webinar includes um, didactic lectures, recorded surgery, and uh, many discussions. We initially also scheduled a uh, live surgery, however, due to a patient issue, the surgery was cancer. And we will find another time soon to do live surgery again. We will introduce our faculty uh, in detail when they give speech. Mini gastric bypass or one anastomosis gastric bypass has more than 20 years history. Also, OAGB is still controversial. It is well accepted in many countries, which makes this procedure the third most uh, performed bariatric or uh, metabolic procedure in the world. The design of OAGB has been uh, becoming more and more standardized. So today we will discuss what make a perfect OHB. I appreciate you to spend time to attend this event. Hopefully this webinar will be informative to, our, to you for your clinical practice. Thanks again to my co-chair, Professor Antonio Torres and all faculty and uh, participants online. And uh, also I give my special thanks to Isish Medical Company for sponsoring the series event. I look forward to working together to deliver a successful educational event. Thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor uh, Zan. Uh, you know, it's my pleasure to co-share with you this important academic event. I'd like also at the beginning and first, uh, you know, thanks uh, the organization and the ICU Medical for his, uh, uh, its uh, continuous support for this academic and, and, and training uh, events like this uh, uh, webinar. I think the agenda is plenty of interest because the focus, the topic, is going to be related with the one anastomosis gastric bypass, uh, increasing uh, uh, procedure, uh, you know, copying uh, many, many, many of the procedure over the world, and I think going to be in the East, China included, of course, it's going to be uh, in the next years one of the most uh, prevalent uh, procedures that surgeons fighting against. Uh, uh, obesity and its metabolic consequences will, will be uh, performing. I think uh, in, for the sake of time, I think we can start, you know, uh, asking Professor Bassen, uh, uh, you know, to give uh, uh, his first uh, speak, uh, a focus on uh, laparoscopic uh, one anastomosis gastric bypass after failed uh, gastric band. Professor Bassen, you know, thank you very much for your kind participation. You can start whatever, uh, whenever you want. Uh, we we see your your screen perfectly. Go ahead, please. Uh, very good. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Torres. Thank you very much, Professor Zhangtao Zhang, Friendship uh, Beijing Friendship Hospital, and thank you, uh, Easy Search Medical. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. So my topic today is mini gastric bypass OAGB after failed gastric banding. I hope uh, the slides are clear. So, sure, sure. The, the yeah, so gastric, great. 
gastric band failures uh, can result from mechanical uh, problems such as slippage, erosions, esophageal dilatations, and can also result from poor outcome in terms of weight loss or weight regain. If you look at most gastric band series in the long term, between 50 to 80% of patients will ultimately require removal and revision. So it's a procedure that really does not have great long-term results. However, patients still request it, still demand it. There are some surgeons who are still performing these procedures. So ultimately, we as surgeons will face from time to time patients who had gastric banding, who gained weight, and who want revisional surgery. So what are the options when we have a patient who had a band and it didn't work? Rebanding is one option. And the three most common procedures that are performed is either a sleep gastrectomy, a Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, MGB, OAGB. And there are few surgeons who do either plication or SADI, but these are not very common. So I'll focus on the three most common procedures. So rebanding is a simple option. And it may be suitable for those patients who've lost weight appropriately, but had mechanical issues such as the band is not working anymore. So it's reasonable to re replace it. However, when we look at the long-term results and compared to Y gastric bypass, rebanding is not a very good option in the long term. What about the sleeve gastrectomy? The sleeve gastrectomy is okay. It gives decent weight loss results appropriate for low BMI, and the advantage is it, it maintains GI continuity. The main disadvantage of converting a band to a sleeve is the scar at the GE junction, which increases the risk of leak. And as you may know, patients who had band suffer from reflux disease. So again, the sleeve gastrectomy will not resolve this issue. The Roux Y gastric bypass has good long-term results after gastric band failure. It will fix the, anti the reflux issues, and it's a good anti-reflux procedure. The disadvantage with the Brunoi gastric bypass, particularly at the GE junction, is the extensive scarring, which will, might make the anastomosis difficult. The MGB OAGB gives very good weight loss results in the long term. The main advantage is that you're doing the anastomosis away from the scar tissue. One of the disadvantages of the MGB OAGB is bile reflux, and that's particular uh, in the uh, Southeast Asia where the uh, incidence or prevalence of gastric cancer is higher than average, so that's one concern. The other problem that potentially we can have with the OAGB is if the leak occurs at the GE junction, that might be problematic because now we have bile. So that's one of the main disadvantages of, of the MGB OAGB. My good friend, uh, Dr. Juan Pujol Rahul's uh, collected see an experience of seven centers, looking specifically at what is the best rescue procedure after failed gastric band. I was fortunate to be one of the seven contributors. And as you can see here, the centers are from Spain, Belgium, Portugal, Mexico, Brazil, and the Netherlands. And the first report came out in 2018. I will give you a summary of the finding. So in total, there were 1,219 patients. Of those, the majority underwent Roux Y gastric bypass after failed gastric band, 191 mini gastric bypass OAGB, and 123 sleeve gastrectomy. Now, when we look at the weight loss at one year onward, and we focus on the final body mass index, the lowest BMI was achieved in the OAGB group, 30.3. The second uh, lowest is the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, and the third is the sleep gastrectomy at 33.6. When we look at the excess BMI loss, the highest was in the OAGB group, 74% versus 66.6 .6 in the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, and the lowest percent excess BMI loss was in the sleeve gastrectomy. And those were statistically significant, all in favor of the OAGB. When we look at the changes in body mass index, you can see from the beginning, 
that the initial BMI was a similar in, in all groups, more or less, maybe the sleeve was a little bit higher. And as you go from year one, three, five, and more, the shaded column in the middle is the OAGB. And you can see that the BMI was consistently lowest in the OAGB. And when you look at this also, the variations in weight were the lowest in the OAGB, meaning that the OAGB after gastric banding in comparison to the Roux and Y gastric bypass, in comparison to the sleeve gastrectomy, gave the most consistent reduction in body mass index. When we looked at the complication rate, again, comparing RYGB, OAGB, and the sleeve gastrectomy, the OAGB had the lowest uh, risk of complications. And that was either when the band was done for insufficient uh, weight, weight loss or for technical problems such as slippage or erosion. So again, that was in favor of the OAGB. One important question we always uh, face in gastric banding, whether we should do the revisional procedure at the time of band removal or remove the band and do it in second stage. So again, we looked at the complication rate comparing one step and two step. And again, here, the OAGB gave the lowest risk of complications. Now, I'll show you a little bit of few videos just to highlight few things because a lot of times our surgical strategy would change into up. So sometimes we say, I want to go and do a sleep gastrectomy and we change or vice versa. So there are some technical consideration uh, that will help us as surgeons to decide what the best option. And that includes what the band has done to the stomach, if it caused erosion or slippage, the extent of scarring at the GE junction, and also considerations such as the small bowel length and the tension. So what I do in general, once I remove the band, is before I decide which procedure I examine the small bowel, make sure that the small bowel has no significant adhesions, and I pull the small bowel to see if there's a lot of tension, the mini gastric bypass is an excellent option. And the next thing I do is I continue with the release of adhesion. And this is a patient who's had the band removed eight years ago. And you can see here, even when the band has been removed a long time ago, you can still see a lot of scarring. I'm using the Easy Search. Uh, ultrasonic dissector and I like it because it has a very long shaft and it's uh, very nice to use when you have a patient who is super obese or a tall patient. You can see the evidence of sutures here and you can really not tell exactly what the anatomy looks like and it's very dangerous to start stapling before you do the extensive dissection otherwise you could be suturing four layers of stomach, one on top of the other and not notice. My strategy is always to look at the GE junction, make sure that I fully identify it. A lot of times there are hiatus hernias that are undetected or you cannot really tell until you do all the dissection and you bring the GE junction into the abdomen. And at that stage, once I finish this, then I start the stapling. Uh, and by that time I would have decided whether it's a RYGB or an OAGB. The poor uh, weight loss that you see with the RYGB in comparison to the OAGB is related to the biliary limb. So nowadays, I even when I do an RYGB, I make the biliary limb at least 150 centimeters. You can see here in the dissection, that the stomach is stuck to one another. That's the fundoplication that was done earlier. A lot of times when the surgeons remove the band, they don't undo the fundoplication. So it's very important to undo the fundoplication before you start any stapling. And again, now I can see the GE junction well. I encircled the uh, GE junction with the Penrose drain. I can see the right cruise, the left cruise very well. Now I'm comfortable that there's no uh, residual hiatal hernia and I can do the uh, stapling at this stage. Last video. 
And when it comes to stapling, it's important to use the thick cartridges. The, uh, the green one uh, that I'm using here, that Easy Surge is uh, excellent. And you can see now the, the GE junction is visualized properly. Many times with the dissection, the fundus becomes ischemic, so I excise that as well. And when there's a hiatus hernia, it's important to uh, close the crura, the diaphragm appropriately. Whether you're doing a sleeve, OAGB, RYGB, uh, I always repair the hiatus hernia at the same time. So in summary, revisional bariatric surgery after failed gastric banding can be challenging. Uh, it is a, a MAGB, OAGB is a safe and effective approach to failed gastric band. The benefit and risks have to be weighed with the pre-op findings, whether a patient has a hiatal hernia, reflux esophagitis, any gastric mucosal abnormalities that predispose them to gastric cancer, BMI, diabetes, etc. And also, the decision is sometimes based on intraoperative finding. What did we find in the OR? Adhesions, tensions on the small bowel, cirrhosis, etc. And again, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to be with you today. I will stop sharing the slides. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Bassan. <clears throat> I think, you know, uh, in terms of explaining a little bit about, uh, you know, how we are going to work in this, uh, in this uh, webinar, I think I'm going to be better uh, to hear all the presentation and then the faculty team can discuss with every speaker. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, Thank you. Will you hear Professor Sam? You know, I think going to be better, you know, to hear uh, all the presentation and then at the end uh, we can discuss with the different faculties. Okay. 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 So, Professor Sam, can you introduce the next speaker? Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, last speaker, Professor uh, Basson. Uh, the next next speaker is uh, uh, Charles Zhang from Beijing Friendship Hospital. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhang, for the introduction. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Charles Zhang. Yes. Are you there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm here. Yeah. Can you hear me? Charles. Hello? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? The voice. Can we cannot hear hear, hear you? Hello? Hello? We cannot hear you. Hello, okay. Okay. There's mm -hmm. a round microphone. All right, thank you so much, Professor John, for the introduction and also uh thanks for uh, Professor Torres, my uh, good friend. Uh, very nice to see you again online and uh, see all my friends here. And also thanks Easy Search for uh, organizing this webinar. I'm going to talk about about uh, why another randomized trial is needed to compare OEGB versus RUNYGB for diabetes remission. Uh, I'm I'm Professor Zhang from uh, Beijing Friendship Hospital. So the the first uh, uh, series uh, mini gastric bypass was published by uh, Robert Rutledge. Uh, he was a surgeon. Charlie, in the Excuse me, excuse me, Charles. Uh, we cannot see your screen yet. Can you share your screen because we can? Okay. We are not able to see it. I'm sorry. I. I'm using my computer. Okay. 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 Can you, can no, you no, we can. Uh, you can, okay. <clears throat> no, we can. Go ahead. Okay, okay. Sorry Perfect. about that. There are some technical issue. So, uh, so I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about uh, why another randomized trial is needed to compare OAGB versus RUNYGB for diabetes remission. Uh, so the the, per, the first patient series of mini gastric bypass, uh, which included about included. More than 1,000 cases was, was published by Dr. Robert Rutledge uh, uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, from his patient series, he had very good uh, outcome, including the, uh, the, the weight loss, including the complication rate was low, and also the OR time was decreased significantly to 36 minutes averagely, and the shortest time was 19 minutes. 
again uh, your child who cannot see your slide. We cannot see your PPT. Ah, can you? You can see my face, sir. Uh, can't see, can't see. Oh, they are on this side. All right, let let me let me keep talking. Then uh, they are going to fix that issue. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, about about uh, uh, four years ago, and uh, and uh, recently also, the IFSO published uh, uh, position uh, position statement on the OEGB, and uh, and uh, try to promote this procedure globally. They saying that this uh, is a good procedure, but there is a lack of long term evidence dur of durability, and also long term uh, nutritional complications needed to be. Investigate f further, and um, and uh, from if so, OEGB is a recognized biology procedure and should not be considered investigational. And uh, and uh, uh, as of this month, uh, U.S. ASMBS and uh, the endorsed procedure they still uh, still has not included OEGB, and uh, they uh, they also have a uh, has a, a position statement on OEGB. And they saying that OEGB has a relatively short operative time, has lower complication rate than other procedures, and also OEGB gives excellent weight loss outcome. And uh, but the evidence level is still low because of most uh, most case series are still retrospective. They're uh, in lack of a lot of re re uh, prospective studies, and also uh, the follow up follow up was uh, short. It's uh, not so many studies follow up for more than five years, and there's still some concerns like a hypoabsorptive nature and the bioreflux. And uh, they, they, they uh, encourage, ASMBS encourage prospective studies with long-term follow up, and they try to, uh, to uh, get this procedure reconsidered. Well, so uh, this uh, uh, level of the other studies uh, including the, uh, let's say, the randomized trial, which has the highest evidence level. So far, there are, there are only three randomized trials uh, compare OEGB versus RUIN-1GB. The first one was published by uh, Professor Wei J. Li in year 2005. They had uh, 80 patients, two groups, and uh, compare OEGB versus uh, RUIN-1GB. The primary endpoint was uh, weight loss. The second one was published by uh, SPAN surgeons, SPAN teams, and uh, compare uh, OEGB versus uh, ruin one gb versus stiff gastrectomy. And uh, the third one was from uh, uh, Robert, Dr. Robert uh, from France. It's a multi-center prospective uh, trial compare OEGB versus ruin one gb And also the primary endpoint was uh, uh, weight loss. So from the WJD study, uh, the, uh, the design was a single center prospective trial and uh, uh, they follow up for two years for excessive weight loss, including the ruin ygb 40 patients and the MGB 40 patients. The surgical procedure was uh, use a uh, uh, ruin ygb use a smaller pouch, which is 15 to 20 mil of smaller gastric pouch. BP lamp was uh, 50 centimeter and the rule lamp is 100 centimeter. And uh, for the mini gastric bypass, the uh, uh, the BP lamp BP lamp was about uh, 200 centimeter. The, the outcome, so you can show the, you compare two procedures, the for outcome, you can see a difference in mean operative time. The OEGB had uh, much less, significantly less time needed for the uh, procedure, only need about uh, 147 minutes, where the ruin YGB needed more than 200 minutes. And also the early post-operative complication rate, OEGB was significantly lower than ruin YGB. And, uh, and also OEGB needed less, uh, painkillers and uh, and uh, hospital stay after surgery, and uh, you can, if you see the excessive weight loss, and the OEGB had the bigger excessive weight loss at one year, but two years after surgery, two group has not did not have any uh, significant difference, and uh, for the uh, blood gluc blood glucose control, the two groups were similar. And the quality of life they are similar uh, between two groups, and also all the uh, adverse event like uh, abdominal pain, like uh, uh, fullness, bloating, and uh, since that, that there's two groups, there was also no, uh, no difference. And uh, so they get the conclusion that uh, both ruin YGB and OEGB are effective for morbid obesity with similar results for resolution of metabolic syndrome and the improved of quality of life. 
And the second conclusion was OEGB is a simpler and a safer procedure that has no disadvantage compared to uh, ruin one gb and two years of follow-up. <coughs> then let's, let's take a look at the second study, which uh, was from uh, Spanish surgeons, it's, uh, including 500 cases, uh, 600 cases. Uh, Steve gastrectomy and the ruin one GB, OEGB each had uh, 200 cases. Uh, say uh, the BMI, the OEGB after surgery, five years after surgery, OEGB had uh, uh, significant more weight loss than the ruin one GB and uh, uh, Steve gastrectomy, and the excessive BMI loss also bigger. You see the uh, type 2D remission rate, OEGB also is the highest. And the hypertension remission rate also OEGB is highest. For the dyslipidemia remission rate, the OEGB also performs the best. Uh, like uh, if, if you take a look at all the nutritional factors like calcium, vitamin D, iron, and uh, vitamin B12, folic acid, etc., there are between three groups, there's no significant difference, but only the iron, uh, you know, is a stiff gastrectomy for iron deficiency was much less than the other uh, two groups. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I uh, don't know why that, that paper was uh, retracted uh, earlier this month. So it's a retracted paper, so uh, we cannot uh, reference that anymore, but uh, I still show the data. To and uh, then uh, the most famous trial is the Omega trial. They compared uh, OEGB versus ruin YGB on the weight loss. That paper was published on license, became the most, pop, most famous trial in our, uh, in our bariatric history. Now that design was an open-label, non-inferiority, randomized uh, control trial. They had uh, nine centers, high-volume centers in France, uh, and the uh, uh, hypothesis that OEGB would not be inferior to ruin YGB if the difference in excess of weight loss, uh, BMI loss was less than 7% or 5 kilogram. And the primary endpoint was excessive weight loss and two years, and uh, used a very, very, uh, very precise statistical method, and uh, so makes that a very high quality stu uh, study. Uh, they use RUNY GB, which is uh, uh, the uh, standard BP length of 50 centimeter, and the rule length of 150 centimeter. Uh, OEGB had uh, uh, 200 centimeter BP length. So first, let's see the weight loss. The two groups, there's no difference. You can see the OEGB uh, versus ruin one gb the difference was quite similar. Uh, then uh, you see the uh, metabolic outcome. You see that all there's, uh, they're, uh, overall they are similar, but uh, if you see the decrease in HbA1c from baseline, OEGB performs better than ruin one gb and by you see, the only uh, that that study was uh, was primarily for the weight loss, but about twenty patient twenty percent patients uh, had uh, diabetes. They compared the diabetes remission rate on those patients. You can see the even there's no uh, didn't reach the statistical power uh, difference because of n number with the diabetes was small. But still, you can see for OEGB after surgery. 6% six six of patients got complete remission at two years. For ruin YGB, only, uh, only like uh, uh, 16 patients got, uh, uh, like 38% uh, of patients got uh, complete permission, uh, remission. If you, if you see the uh, partial commission rate, remission rate, so the, you, you add partial uh, remission and the complete remission, two groups are similar, but uh, OEGB obviously had much more uh, patient got complete remission. And uh, give us some signal that OEGB is better uh, than ruin YGB in type two diabetes treatment. Uh, you see the side effect, adverse event, you see the only difference of HbA1, uh, sorry, hemoglobin uh, level is lower in OEGB than the ruin YGB, otherwise they are comparable. And uh, if you see the uh, operation related complications and uh, uh, they, are, they are similar, but uh, you can see, see some patients with uh, bioreflex, and also you see the, uh, they did uh, esophageal biopsy. Uh, you can see some difference here. And uh, one patient in OHB got a metaplasia. Uh, then the other complications, including nutrition complications, 
uh, OEGB seems higher in number, but there's, there's no uh, statistical difference. You see a reflux, that's some difference here. Uh, ruin one GB had more patients with abdominal pain, and uh, things like that. Yeah, so, uh, and uh, uh, interesting, about uh, four patients in OEGB literally need to revision to the ruin one GB. So that's, uh, uh, that's a patient series. So the conclusion from the Yomega trial is that OEGB is not inferior to ruin one GB regarding weight loss and metabolic improvement at two years. There's a higher incidence of diarrhea, diarrhea, and the nutrition adverse event in the uh, OEGB. Uh, then uh, uh, recently, Dr. WJD published another uh, paper showing that 20 years experience of uh, OEGB, his, his personal experience in his center in saying that OEGB is a very safe procedure, only 0.4% major complication rate at the recent five years, and also weight loss was uh, durable. And, uh, and also, it's very effective for type 2D treatment. And uh, overall, the revision rate was only 5.1%, uh, which is low. And the malnutrition was the first indication for, for the revision, followed by weight regain and the reflux disease. If you see the, uh, the body weight change, you can see that the, after one year, the body weight, body weight loss was really durable, consistent. So there's, you don't see the average, you don't see a re rebound of body weight. Uh, so, uh, we also still some questions remain to be answered. And the first one is, is bioreflux a real concern for OEGB? Then uh, what's the ideal length of BP lamp and the ideal size of stoma? And uh, is OEGB really better for type 2D diabetes? The first one, bioreflux. We know that uh, there, there's some concern uh, <coughs> of bioflux after OEGB, but bioflux sometimes can cause reactive gastritis, but its uh, percentage was very low. And the uh, reactive gastritis has a very small potential to cause the gastric cancer, esophageal cancer, but you, you try to connect that. Is, will OEGB cause gastric or esophageal cancer? Probably not. For, for each step, there's only single digit percentage. So you, you put that together, it's a very, very small chance you can get the gastric cancer. So I, the, the the conclusion might be probably not, OEGB probably not cause gastric cancer, and uh, by long-term follow-up needed. Then the ideal length of BP lamp, there's a trend probably we need, OEGB need a longer BP lamp, but some study or some, uh, some surgeons think the BP lamp is, uh, probably needs to be shorter, so this is still arguable. And the ideal size of stoma, this is a larger uh, stoma or s smaller, uh, like, uh, uh, gastrojejunal uh, anosomosis opening, use a different, uh, uh, use a wide GG or versus small GG, you see a difference uh, with loss at six months. Yeah, you see the difference with loss at six months, but after 12 months, you don't see difference between a bigger uh, anosomosis versus smaller anosomosis. So still, now also we have some opportunities to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to do some, uh, some other studies. So the Professor Lee, which study could could now be renewed after 15 years because of uh, that that study was done long time ago. It's a very nice study, but uh, we now have updated surgical techniques. So we also need a multi center, and uh, we can update our hypothesis to type 2D cure rate instead of weight loss. And also, your mega trial can be supplemented. We can focus on diabetes treatment as primary endpoint instead of BMI loss. And also we can focus on low BMI obese patients. And then we can design a superiority trial instead of non-inferiority trial. So that's our opportunity. Therefore, so led by uh, our, our webinar chair, uh, Professor Zheng Tao Zhang, uh, we uh, initiate another uh, trial. We try to compare OEGB versus ruin gb for diabetes remission. It's going to be a prospective, multicentric, randomized, superior trial. Uh, so we call that other trial. It's uh, going to be inter interventional, including 160 patients in each arm. Going, uh, going to uh, do the parallel assignment. Um, so the hypothesis and the primary op endpoint for all the trial is that MGB is superior to ruin gb in type 2 diabetes treat treatment remission rate in obese patients. So this is the hypothesis. Uh, we want to approve that. 
the prime endpoint going to be the uh, cure rate of type 2 D uh, diabetes after two different procedures. We think that uh, OEGB should be better, uh, get better percentage, better chance of remission uh, than the ruin YGB. So the, the first time point was one year going to fall up for three, five years. And it's go, going to be a superiority design. OEGB has 5% more cure rate than ruin YGB. That's our uh, superiority margin. So this study has, uh, is consulted by Professor Wei uh, and also Professor Maud Robert and uh, Professor Scott Shikora and uh, also Professor Steve Granbaugh. Professor Steve Granbaugh is the chief, uh, the chair of uh, biostatistics uh, in Duke University. And uh, this multi-center trial will be officially started later this year. And, uh, and uh, we, we feel really excited by, by this study, going to add some more values to the OEGB uh, in future. So that's my talk, thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Charles, uh, for this outstanding and challenging uh, uh, lecture. I think we can discuss during the the the, uh, the discussion time. You know the different aspects and congratulations for this nice uh, proposal uh, of performing the order uh, trial in the future. Probably this trial will clarify uh, some uh, hidden or not very clear. Uh, issue regarding this controversy. Okay, we will discuss later on with our uh, discussions. Uh, let me introduce next speaker, Professor Giovanni Dapri. He's a very good friend of mine. You know, we met many, many years ago, uh, and now uh, he is one of the most uh, relevant uh, uh, scientists in Europe. I know the world very well known for he uh, his uh, less uh, invasive approaches uh, to uh, this topic, to obesity and to bariatric metabolic surgery. So Giovanni, uh, your turn. Uh, please go ahead uh, whenever you want. Okay, uh, so good morning to everybody. Good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Torres, uh, Antonio, uh, very nice friend since time, and Professor uh, Zhang. And of course, um, uh, the Easy Search, Easy Search uh, group and for the, this kind of invitation and uh, organization. So I share my screen. Um, the topic uh, uh, of today uh, assigned to me is uh, one anastomosis cast bypass uh, performed by reduced scar laparoscopy. Um, and uh, so I'm uh, uh, introduce uh, this topic uh, with uh, some paper appear in uh, the literature. The first one uh, regard the first consensus statement on a, a 1A uh, GB or a mini cast bypass. And uh, uh, this paper appeared in 2019, and the conclusion uh, were that uh, the, um, the expert achieved consensus on a number of aspects concerning this procedure, but several areas of disagreement persist emphasizing uh, the need for more studies in the future. Then, uh, two years, uh, sorry, okay. Two years, okay, voila. Two years later, uh, the uh, International Federation for Surgery for Obesity uh, wrote a consensus conference uh, on uh, one uh, anastomosis test bypass and the uh, conclusion were that uh, I thought there is a general agreement that this procedure is effective and safe for the management of obesity or severe obesity. Again, numerous areas of non-consensus remain in its use. So um, data are needed. And so, uh, just a, 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 a few weeks ago, uh, another paper uh, to respond uh, to these uh, two previous papers appeared uh, just uh, online. 
and uh, uh, there is evidence to include the uh, uh, mini bypass or one anastomosis gastric bypass as an accepted standard procedure, bariatric and metabolic surgery. However, as already mentioned by uh, previous speakers, long-term data and more research are needed to have a consensus, including all the aspects that uh, were uh, concerned in the previous paper regarding uh, this uh, uh, procedure. So, uh, coming back now uh, to uh, the talk assigned to me, uh, uh, in uh, Belgium, we started to perform a reduced support laparoscopy in 2018. Uh, I had the pleasure to collaborate with Professor Mori from Tokyo in order to uh, wrote a paper uh, in uh, uh, 2014. And you see that the main advantages for reducer scar or reducer for laparoscopy are the decreased invasivity of minimal invasive surgery because we use less trocar and less um, uh, uh, giant trocar. So which means, for example, three millimeter or less than three millimeter trocas. And uh, uh, we decrease the complication related to the trochus, for example, the hair bleeding, the infection, and overall the ventral hernia. And uh, the most important aspect uh, regarding the patient is the increased uh, patient cosmetic outcomes. So <clears throat> since that, um, I published uh, two years ago the 10 year experience in uh, uh, 1,700 uh, laparoscopy on a surgical technology international. And uh, I compiled also another book uh, regarding just uh, the technique that we developed in Brussels and regarding this uh, procedure in all general surgery, not only in obesity. Now, uh, for the uh, meeting of today, uh, I present a video like uh, uh, one, uh, mentioned in the program and uh, uh, the clinical case regards a, a 38 years old woman with a BMI of 40 and a weight of 111 kilo. Uh, in the preparatory workup, uh, in all of these patients, like I suppose in the rest of the bariatric centers, uh, we perform a gastroscopy uh, uh, where in this case there was no yatalania, no reflux and no esophagitis. And also we used to perform a, a biopsy of the stomach in order to detect the presence or not of helicobacter pylori because if in case of positive, we do uh, antibiotic therapy before, and then uh, we um, uh, we perform uh, a control by a breath test uh, uh, six weeks later, and then we operate the patient in order to decrease the risk of uh, uh, the major risk is the uh, gastric ulcers at, at the level of a gastrointestinal. The other preparative workup uh, exam we include is abdominal ultrasonography in order to understand if there is an hepatic steatosis which can compromise the exposure of the operative feed, especially when the uh, left liver orb is uh, uh, hypertrophic. And then uh, we identify if there is the presence or not of uh, uh, the gastos. Uh, in case of presence of gastons, uh, our attitude is to remove the cold bladder during uh, uh, the procedure of bariatric surgery. And then, of course, uh, we conclude the preparatory workup with uh, the advice from nutritionists, dietologists, and psychologists uh, in order to have uh, a multidisciplinary uh, uh, compliance, and uh, uh, which is uh, uh, very important. Uh, to uh, follow the patient after the surgery uh, by the nutritionist and psychologist overall uh, in order to don't lose the patient uh, and to continue to follow him or her, uh, not only from the weight uh, loss point of view, but also from the other uh, uh, obesity um, uh, disease co correlated. So now 
This is the video. So uh, you see that we place in this patient a 12 millimeter trocar in the umbilicus, so there is no scar. And we place other two trockers of five millimeter in the right and left flank. So the procedure is performed with three total uh, trockers. And um, the optical system in the beginning is placed in the umbilicus, is a 10 millimeter, 30 degree. And here, uh, we see that uh, uh, we uh, start with uh, the introduction of uh, a straight percutaneous suture under the xiphoid axis in order to remove, to um, uh, expose the uh, uh, region of the stomach. And so we place this in the apex of the right crural. And then we remove uh, this straight needle and we uh, and we fix the straight needle the, the suture sorry by Kelly Grasper at the uh, outside external. Uh, we start the procedure so we identify the um, uh, the incisional angularis as recommended. We stay just uh, one centimeter up in order to avoid uh, the problem of bleeding because this area, as uh, the name says, is uh, uh, very uh, vascularized and so uh, to avoid uh, a problem of bleeding we stay a little bit uh, upper in order to maintain in any case a, a long gastric tube and uh, uh, we stay in a perigastric uh, uh, dissection we use a coagulating hook and we use also a automatic grasping forces in order to get the access to the um, um, lesser sac. Here you see that uh, we uh, do a dissection meticulously of uh, the different uh, gastric vessels going uh, in the posterior gastric wall. And here we introduce uh, the stapler, we change the <laughs> scope into a five millimeter scope. We introduce the scope on the left axis of the abdomen and we introduce the stapler in the middle in the 12 millimeter trocar in the umbilicus. Um, we place the first firing uh, quite horizontally uh, and uh, you see that we don't use a complete firing of CST because we have to construct a pouch and so it is not, it is enough to use half of it and we use a blow cartridge because this is a, preview, a primary procedure in a patient never operated before. And so it is not necessary to use a, a thicker um, uh, stapler like a green one. Once we have done the first firing, we introduce uh, the second one. And uh, after you have in, you know, well uh, placed the stapler with an articulation, and this is one of the advantages of this stapler because we have a 60 degree um, angulation. We ask to the anesthesiologist only in this moment to place and to push down the orogastric bougie of 36 French. In this way, we can calibrate the pouch correctly without an avoiding of uh, too much pouch, for example, too much large and uh, to reach uh, usually the main objective, which is a correct weight loss. Here you see under the three trockers, the scope on the left abdomen, the firing of the stapler in the middle and the umbilicus, and uh, uh, with uh, uh, not too much bleeding at the level of uh, the firings. And this is another uh, important uh, uh, aspect which can be considered in using this stapler. Here, uh, you see that uh, after the second firing, uh, we uh, place uh, the uh, third, and uh, again, we place the third staying uh, uh, just uh, at uh, uh, the lateral side of the bougie, and we don't stretch too much, we just stay uh, slowly uh, with uh, the placement of this stapler in order to don't stretch the tissue uh, cut the tissue correctly without too much tension and a possible leak on uh, uh, the stapler. 
here. Uh, we place the stapler and we fire the stapler. And again, we use blue load, so not thick the uh, stapler because it is a primary procedure and not a revisional wave addition. Now, very importantly, in order to place the last one or one of the last one, we do a retrogastric tunnel because we need to dissect this area uh, uh, in order to find a good uh, tunnel for the introduction of the stapler. So the technique we developed and we um, uh, reported in literature in a randomized trident on sleeve gastrectomy with the two techniques from lateral to medial, medial to lateral in uh, back in uh, 2010 on obesity surgery. You see here that we dissect the uh, angle of his from butter to top until to reach the uh, uh, phrenogastric ligament on the left side uh, from uh, posterior. Once we have uh, uh, created this uh, tunnel, uh, we introduce uh, the stapler. The stapler is again the blue load and without any tension of the stomach, you see, we do the transaction of the visceral. And this is very important because in this way, especially when we do a sleeve of the same technique, we transact the last firing with, uh, um, without tension. And so we avoid a possible and potential risk of leak, which is especially in this area when we perform a sleeve gastrectomy. But again, also with uh, an, uh, uh, bypass, mini bypass, one anastomosis or standard or why it can be possible. So. Uh, once we have finished to perform the long uh, gastric pouch, we uh, used to uh, place some suture uh, between the two stepper line. And uh, this is uh, something that we use uh, to do in our uh, department in order to, <coughs> sorry, in order to avoid a leak between uh, the two stepper line. Uh, uh, we use a Vicry 2.0 and we use intracorporeal knot. And uh, these sutures are performed um, on the gastric pouch as well as on the uh, gastric rem. After this step, uh, we do the gastrojejunostomy and we do a, a hands-on technique. So we introduce a suture, the first one, and then we uh, search the uh, ligament of trades so we expose uh, the transverse mesocolon in order to identify the first uh, bowel loop. And you see here, we look uh, and we try to identify the first bowel loop, which is here. And um, uh, we have to identify some times. So we, uh, event in, uh, we put in evidence the um, inferior mesenteric vein. And then we measure with uh, the graspers you see here, with the five centimeter, uh, we measure the correct limb uh, of the biliopancreatic limb reaching uh, the gastrojejunostomy. The gastrojejunostomy is performed uh, in our hands by only one technique, which is the handsome technique, uh, because uh, we uh, did a randomized study back uh, again more than 10 years ago between circular, linear, and manual. And uh, the advantages of the manual are lesser uh, gastric ulcer and less stenosis than the other techniques. So the technique consists in to perform a posterior running suture first using uh, 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 PDS-1. This technique was uh, uh, taught to us, uh, uh, as you know, by uh, my uh, my pastor from Professor Jack Invans. And so uh, after to have finished the posterior running suture, we start with a new suture, uh, the anterior one, and then we open both visera. We ask to be anesthesiologists to push down the orogastric bougie, and we uh, open first the stomach uh, with uh, the coagulating hook, and then uh, we open the jejunum. Of course, the bougie is clamped in order to avoid the loss of pneumoperitoneum. And uh, we open uh, roughly 
1.5 centimeter. This is one of the advantages of a, uh, the manual anastomosis, the hands-on, because you can decide how long, how long is uh, uh, this anastomosis. You can control the bleeding and you can control also the leak. In order to control the leak, you see that first we reinforce the lateral angle with the anterior running suture, the last and the new suture we place, and we do full thickness bites in order to uh, close uh, the anterior lead. Uh, once we have done uh, three, four bias on the anterior layer, you will see soon, what we used to do is to reinforce the medial corner of this anastomosis with the uh, posterior running suture. Of course, the bougie is pushed into the small bowel in order to uh, avoid the problem of stricter, which is another potential complication of gastrojejunostomy. And here you see the trick to avoid the leak is to use the posterior running suture for a few bites going anteriorly and uh, overall closing the uh, medial uh, corner of the anastomosis. And in this way, uh, we are sure that uh, we have closed correctly and we avoid the problem of the leak. Of course, you use both hands in order to pass your uh, needle, the right and the left hand, and then you continue with the anterior running suture in order to uh, um, close the, uh, um, uh, the layer and uh, uh, to finish this one layer hand to sign, hand soon, gastrojejunostomy. At the end, uh, the both sutures are, are tied together intracorporeally. And again, you see the PDS1, which is uh, a quite big but uh, mm -hmm. well reinforced suture. And so the bougie is checked to be removed in order to be sure that there is no stricture and the bougie pass well through the anastomosis. And so here you see the omega uh, bypass or the one anastomosis uh, uh, mini bypass. Here the bougie that goes up and down in order to check its passage uh, through the gastrojejunostomy and avoiding uh, too much uh, pressure and uh, perforation. The biliary limb on the left side of the screen and the alimentary limb. Very importantly, we used to finish the procedure with the fermature, with the closure, sorry, of the Peterson space. The Peterson space was described in 1903, and uh, it is the space between the mesentery of the alimentary limb going up to the gastrojejunostomy and the transverse colon, like you see here. The transverse mesocolon is uh, joined and headed to the mesentery of the alimentary limb using a, a suture, and we use for this technique a, a posting suture with a non-absorbable material like a polypropylene or proline to zero. And uh, we uh, pass different bites, we use intracorporeal knot, and we are uh, quite satisfied about the results. And so here is the end of the procedure. We remove the suture, we don't do a test because we are satisfied and uh, we remove the trockers under control and we close the umbilical skull. Uh, the results usually are less than one hour. The patient, very importantly, remain in the hospital two days. We do aliment, um, alimentary diet with a liquid in the first two weeks and then semi-liquid, semi-solid, and after one month, a solid. And so, in conclusion, first of all, uh, one anastomosis gastric bypass or mini bypass is feasible to be performed by a reducer number of the trocas, so what we call reduced score laparoscopy. Uh, second, uh, when uh, you have uh, in your consultation, young woman with an acceptable BMI in, in the, uh, of course, recommendation uh, uh, for surgery, and without too much comorbidities and uh, overall with uh, demanding of the patient for a minimal surgical trauma, 
This, consider can, this procedures can be considered and reduced to the number of the trocar and the size of the trocar. And so the results in terms of weight loss and other resolution or improvement of comorbidities are the same as the standard conventional multi trocar five, six, seven trocars, mini or one anastomosis cardiac bypass, but the different advantages are especially the increase uh, the enhanced uh, um, cosmetic outcomes. So I uh, thank you very much and uh, I uh, stop to share my video. And now uh, I suppose we start the discussion later, no? Okay, okay, yeah, thank sure. you. We will yeah. do the discussion later on. Okay, thank Hello, you. Professor thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's thank go you. to the... Thank you, Armer, for you. Uh, excellent lecture on the uh, surgery. Uh, I'm very interested in your reduced uh, trauma laparoscopic surgery. And uh, after the next speaker, we will discuss together. So, uh, we, we, we will welcome the next speaker, uh, Hui Liang from uh, Nanjing, China. Uh, he is also my old friend. Uh, is he is a, a very famous uh, bi bariatric sur surgeon in China. Uh, welcome, Professor Liang, Professor Hui Liang. Are you are you here? I cannot hear you, your voice, yeah? Open your... Yes, Professor Zhang. Yeah, welcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm here. But uh, maybe waiting a uh, minute because now I'm in the OT. Yeah. So... Uh, You're so busy. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Europe, uh, so I uh, will to uh, um, Learn something from the uh, OAGB study the, about uh, the evidence. So now to share my uh, uh, PPT. Uh, <laughs> 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 Keynote, Keynote, Keynote. Where's my Keynote? So, uh, can you watch my the PPT? No? No. No, yes. No, no. Okay, okay. I can use my the. Uh, uh, we have one. We have Oh, sorry.
<音>不是他这个信号不好 So now, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, yeah. Uh, and we see your computer screen. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, so now I share my the, uh, slide. Yeah, okay. Okay, it's okay. So I'm so sorry about that. Because now I'm in the OT. <laughs> okay. that, yeah. That's perfect, Professor Lian. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, Torres, very nice to see you in here. Uh, so, uh, my topic is about the clinical evidence of the OHB for metabolic surgery. Uh, we all know that uh, in the 1997, the rotated introduced a different uh, uh, gastric bypass. Maybe it's different from the uh, Mason and Eaton's uh, procedure. In 2002, uh, Cabajo um, said, uh, uh, tell us about the techniques, uh, technique uh, variation to prevent uh, GE bioreflux. Uh, they called uh, his, his uh, procedure named the OHB, the one announced Thomas's gastric bypass. In 2013, the confusion created by the various names led a group of surgeons to use a standard name, mini gastric bypass, one anastomosis gastric bypass to define this surgery. Since 2011, OHB now has become an increasingly prevalent bariatric surgical procedure across the globe and uh, represented 1.5% of all uh, surgery procedures. The IFUSO has agreed this, uh, at this standard uh, nomenclature for this procedure. 
should be the uh, mini gastric bypass and um, one anastomosis gastric uh, bypass. And so from the mini gastric bypass to the OAGB, uh, they have some of the technicals changed. Uh, this is the GI. Uh, we can find uh, that uh, maybe it's different from the uh, extra-random major. So how about the OAGB, the safety? Uh, there are so many, many the studies about this, the safety and the effect of the OHB. Uh, maybe most of the studies showing that the uh, OHB reduced the operation time and the uh, mortality and the mobility uh, rate. Uh, that means the complications uh, associated with the operation maybe is uh, decreased after the OAGB compared to the sleeve and especially compared, uh, it's a significant difference compared to the Rui bypass. So how about the long-term out outcomes? Uh, we all know that the short-term uh, outcomes after the OAGB is uh, uh, very, maybe it's uh, like uh, um, uh, compared, comparable to the uh, Rui bypass. But how about the long-term uh, outcomes? The weight loss following OHB appears to be comparable to those of the Rui bypass with a uh, pooled percent excess weight loss of uh, about uh, 17 to 85 cents at uh, five years followed up. In studies which reported the one year post-operative, the excess weight loss significant uh, weight loss. That means excess weight loss more than 50 was obtained in, in all in all in all the cases, and uh, uh, the excess weight loss continued to increase during the follow up uh, at the uh, one year, two year, and the five years. This is uh, 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 about the long term is followed up the 12 years after the OAGB. Uh, we, we can find that the... the sorry. sorry. Oh my It's about the 12 years uh, after the uh, OAGB. Uh, we, we can find the OAGB safe and the effect, uh, effectiveness. And, and the reduce, and the OAGB reduced the difficulty operation, uh, operation time. Early and late complications is uh, uh, lesser compared to the Rui bypass. And the weight loss resolution of comorbidities and the uh, um, degree of satisfaction are similar to results obtained with more aggressive and uh, complex techniques. This means the OAGB maybe is easy, easier uh, to perform and the nutrition complications maybe uh, is, uh, is rare compared to the Rui bypass. Um, sorry. There are some uh, problem about the theory. <laughs> I'm sorry. Wait. Okay. The OAGB maybe it's not a restrictive procedure. Uh, maybe most of the uh, study is about the metabolism problem resolution. Uh, laparoscopic mini gastric bypass resulted in significant and uh, sustained weight loss with successful treatment of type 2 diabetes uh, up to 87%, despite a slightly lower response rate of type 2 diabetes in treatment. Patients with BMI uh, lower, than, lower than 35 still had an acceptable uh, diabetes re resolution. And this uh, treatment option can be offered to this group of patients. Uh, it's maybe in some of the uh, 
uh, lower scores of the ABCD score, uh, maybe uh, the resolution rate is good. This is about the uh, type two remission um, in the two, uh, 102, uh, 102 uh, diabetes patients. The average excess weight loss uh, one year after OAGB was 18, 88. Of the of these the diabetes patients, um, is is uh, about uh, uh, nineteen two uh, patients, um, resolution about the uh, diabetes. So, uh, in this the data we can find that the OHB may be performed safely and with the promising efficacy, as uh, both a primary and a revision bariatric surgery, and it offers excellent resolution of diabetes. And uh, uh, there are some of the uh, data from, um, from the 2000s uh, till now. They have some the, uh, uh, data and study about uh, the weight loss and uh, the type 2 diabetes uh, remission. Uh, this is some of the data. We can find that most of the uh, type 2 diabetes resolution is more than 80%. Uh, that's very good. There also have some of the RCT study uh, uh, compare the mini bypass by bypass to the sleeve gastrectomy or the Rui bypass. Uh, this is the uh, paper. It's about the mini bypass compared to the uh, sleeve gastrectomy to treat the type two diabetes. We can find that the BMI change from the baseline. Maybe the mini bypass is better uh, compared to sleeve gastrectomy and the. Uh, HB1C is uh, also good. And uh, uh, in creatine effect calculated five years after a metabolic surgery, uh, we can find the in creatine uh, effect and uh, uh, the, um, that's, they have some the significant uh, difference compared to the sleeve gastrectomy. So in mid uh, obese, obese patient with type 2 diabetes, sleeve is effective at uh, the improved glycemic control at five years, but uh, the OHB was more uh, likely to achieve better um, glycemic control than sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, this is about the mini gastric bypass had a lot of advantages. Sorry. Uh, the, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. There have some the uh, study is about the, the um, mini gas bypass compared to the sleeve. Uh, the the same size maybe is uh, more than one hundred cases, but. Uh, uh, most of, of this the study is not a RCT study. And mini cancer bypass had a lot of advantages. Uh, we can find that uh, high level excess weight loss and the higher five years excess weight loss, higher type two diabetes remission rate, higher hypertension remission, and the uh, um, OSA uh, remission rate maybe is higher. And uh, uh, because of the mini bypass is a simple procedure, so the complication rate is uh, lower. Uh, there are some of the RCT study is compared to the Rui bypass. Uh, we can find this the OHB maybe have a, a, a higher uh, excess weight loss and the TWL. The TWL malnutrition and the comorbidity remission three years postoperative were comparable. And the uh, G reflux, reflux was less frequently after the UI bypass, uh, but it's higher in the uh, OHB. And uh, uh, there are no doping syndrome were found in OHB. They also have some, this is a, a RCT study it's about the, uh, the Rui bypass and the OATB. Uh, we, we can find this, the OATB is not inferior to RYGB, 
regarding weight loss and the metabolic improvement at uh, two years. Uh, this is a very important uh, uh, paper uh, published in the Lancet. And this is the data showing that a high incidence of the diarrhea, uh, steatorrhea, and uh, nutrition adverse event was observed with uh, 200 centimeters uh, BP limb in OHB. And I think this is the uh, this the study is very important and uh, it's uh, the first uh, stage evidence about the OATB. Compared to SLEEV and the RUI bypass, this is another the RCT study. Uh, we can find that the OATB achieves the superior mid and longer weight loss than RUI bypass and the SLEEV. The OATB, OATB achieves better short and long term resolution rate of diabetes and uh, hypertension and uh, uh, lipid resolution than the sleeve and the Ruy uh, bypass. But also there is some, something we should too concern. Uh, Pre-operative assessment, uh, all these uh, um, mini OATB or mini gastric bypass, we should too um, perform the pre-operative endoscopy and uh, uh, routine screen patients for HP. And the intraoperating technical details, uh, details uh, overwhelmingly uh, routine use a bulge to size the bulge. And uh, we also to uh, perform the linear stabilized gastro uh, genunostomy followed by suture close, close of the enterotomy. That's to prevent the stenosis. And the BP limb, maybe uh, there are some the, uh, different lengths uh, in different uh, studies. Uh, most of the BP limb, most of the paper showing that the BP limb uh, is 200 centimeters. But uh, if more than said, uh, 200, said, said, 200 said, uh, centimeters, we should to measure the uh, common channel length. The post discharge management, uh, marginal ulcer, uh, I, I think for the Eastern uh, Asian. Uh, most of the general surgeon, we always concern this about the marginal ulcer after the OAGB. So the PPI maybe uh, is uh, recommended for uh, these patients. Micronutrition and uh, supplementation. Uh, one asked regarding IR uh, and uh, um, we should to recommend the patient to uh, intake some of the uh, macronutrition. The gold dose maybe is not so uh, common um, for the OAGB patients. Also, they have some of the leak reported uh, after the OAGB. The leak rate after OAGB was reported to be less than 1%, so it's uh, rare. And, and there are some of the, um, um, treatment about this the leak. Uh, it's about the 35% uh, to conserve, cons uh, conservative, and, uh, some, and about 30% conversion to the RUI bypass. The most commonly used approach was either uh, conservative or conversion to the RUI bypass. The male nutrition um, in reported in um, uh, more than half the studies. The male nutrition uh, after OAGB, uh, one use a uh, two meter BP limb, maybe it's uh, common. The most common encountered BP limb length was again uh, 200 centimeters. This fixed length left, I mean, uh, CC is about uh, uh, two, uh, 3,000 centimeters, 300 centimeters in this patient's population. Also, the wide range of the uh, common channel reflects the wide variation of the total small bowel length uh, between different patients. So it's keen to measure the total uh, small bowel length and uh, to ensure that the uh, CC uh, more than 300 centimeters. Uh, also, there have some of the anemia. The IA uh, deficiency anemia is uh, common and uh, has a variation incidence from five to 10. Percent. I think uh, uh, it's very important for the Chinese and uh, the East Asian patients after the OAGB. Uh, the bioreflux, I think, is uh, 
uh, concert, we always to think about the gastric cancer um, in uh, Asian, East Asian. The six months post-operatively, bioreflux was reported in the ports uh, in 30%. Uh, so I, I think we uh, have some um, worried about uh, is, uh, is about this uh, complication, complication because the bioreflux maybe is associated with the gastric cancer. Uh, maybe uh, it's need a long uh, term and the persistent reflux cause the uh, esophageal uh, metaplasia and the esophageal uh, adenocarcinoma. Uh, maybe it's need time, uh, maybe more than 20 years after the OAGB. So um, we should too, uh, while the available evidence supports a prudent attitude and the status that is reasonable to indicate OAGB for patients over 15 years of age. To confirm or disprove said progression for the follow-up is needed. And there are some the technical things about the 18 reflux. Um, uh, the professor showing his uh, uh, surgery video uh, showing that the anti-reflux techniques. The revision surgery, um, there's some the potential uh, severe specific complications, including uh, malnutrition, liver failure, and uh, bioreflux that may require surgical correction after the OAGB. The rule I bypass appears to be the most commonly performed the procedure. So the IFUSO uh, uh, have some of the recommendation and um, it's about the OATB should be the identifier uh, uh, for this procedure in future publications. And uh, patients on the OATB in the revision setting have less weight loss and more complications than with primary procedures. Uh, that means the OATB maybe it's better in the uh, primary surgery compared to the second uh, revision surgery. Uh, surgeons performing this as well as any other bariatric surgery procedure are encouraged to participate in the national or international registry so that the long-term data may be more effectively identified. So um, the evidence maybe is not so many, especially in the uh, first stage, evidence is rare. So um, in the, some of the uh, retrospective study uh, showing that the TWL malnutrition and the comorbidity remission were comparable to sleeve on the rule bypass. But some of the RCT study showing that the OAGB is not uh, inferior to rule bypass in terms of weight loss and the metabolic improvement at the two years. Higher incidence of complications and the nutrition diverse events were observed in the OAGB group than in the RUI bypass. And the prospective study with long-term follow-up are needed, especially to uh, sense the risk of the um, bioreflux in the long-term and the effect of the modifying the length of the uh, BP Lim on um, outcomes. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm so sorry about the delay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think it's uh, going to be a nice discussion. And uh, you know, we already enjoyed uh, very much, Professor Lian, uh, your talk. I think now I think we we can uh, you know uh, open uh, a nice uh, uh, round of discussion. Uh, let's uh, ask you know Professor San to, uh, to 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 try to introduce the different panelists and to ask them for some common question to our speaker, Professor San, uh, whatever you All want. Right. All right, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Thank you so much uh, for every speaker and all sex uh, Dr. Torres. Uh, now let me introduce all the discussions, uh, including Professor uh, uh, Professor Nenwei Zhang. He's uh, Vice President of Chinese MBS 
and uh, uh, and also vice president of Beijing Shijitan Hospital, uh, affiliate to Be uh, Capital Medical University, and uh, the other discussion professor Jiang Tao, uh, he's from uh, Jilin University. He's a uh, chief of uh, metabolic surgery, and uh, professor Wei Liu, uh, he is from uh, the second Xiangyang Hospital of uh, South. Central South University in China, and also he's, uh, he's not only a bariatric surgeon, he's also a HPB surgeon. And uh, Professor Yang Liu, uh, he's our partner in Beijing Friendship Hospital in the Capital Medical University. So I, uh, I mean, it, now it's time for discussion. Go ahead, guys. Okay, so so Doctor Wei Liu, you have uh, okay. Any yeah, sure, comments? Sure. Okay, okay, I, I got you. Okay, uh, first of all, I want to uh, express my appreciation to have this opportunity to listen to this full excellent speech by these international speakers. I'm really grateful uh, to have to be in, uh, invited in this conference. So the. Uh, but the OAGB has been a really a hot topic in recent years uh, in the field of bariatric surgery and metabolic surgery. And from these four speakers, I really learned a lot. So uh, I still have some uh, questions uh, to, uh, to, to, to you four speakers. And uh, uh, some uh, maybe to specific professors and some to your uh, four uh, general uh, questions. So uh, my first question is about uh, the um, the uh, safety of this OHGB. Uh, as we know, the OHGB is really uh, you know, comparable with RHGB in terms of the therapeutic effect, and sometimes can uh, uh, and also can lead to a shorter operating time and a, short and a shorter hospital uh, stay. But uh, I wonder, uh, as Dr. Liang uh, gave us the evidence that there is about 1% of, uh, of, of leakage after OHGB, and uh, uh, in my opinion, the leakage after RHGB is really not uh, that big uh, concern because it always can be upheld uh, by conservative, you know, treatment uh, by drainage. But if we, we know in OHGB, if we get a leakage and the, uh, you know, the uh, digestive fluid will be the uh, bio mixed with pancreatic juice, mixed with uh, uh, gastric acid, so it, it's very digestive, you know, uh, uh, act, uh, active uh, fluid. And I, I, because I never have this uh, case before, so I wonder, uh, from your four experienced surgeons, uh, do you ever had any patient that has this uh, leakage after OHP? And if that happened, is that adding, you know, more uh, uh, like difficult to treat in terms of conservative or, or uh, re, re, -oper re surgery? I mean, to 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 this problem. So that's my first question, and uh, my second question is about the. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, another another uh, concern about the uh, uh, post-operative, you know, uh, of OHB. I I I had some uh, experience on the OHB, and I see some patients really have this dumping syndrome. People uh, experience uh, the patient experience uh, hypoglycemia uh, during uh, after uh, after uh, dinner, and uh, some of this hypoglycemia can be very severe. So we have to adjust this, uh, you know, for the intake. Uh, and uh, the type of uh, the food, and also we have to do some treatment to relieve this dumping syndrome. So I wonder, is there any difference uh, of dumping syndrome uh, between uh, RHGB and the OHGB? Would that be better for, uh, for OHGB to avoid this uh, type of uh, post-operative complications? So uh, my question to all your four uh, speakers. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Professor Liu. Uh, I think this question, the first question is about the leak after OEGB. I want to give this question to Professor uh, Giovanni Depre. Yeah, yeah, so uh, the question regards the leak, correctly? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, so, uh, uh, I think, uh, first of all, uh, the leak is uh, um, um, uh, an aspect that concerns especially the learning curve of the surgeon. 
Uh, so uh, once uh, uh, the surgeon get or got sorry the good uh, uh, learning surge uh, uh, learning curve i think that the leak is reduced in terms of uh, rate second it regards uh, the type of anastomosis because uh, for example the handsome technique that i showed uh, if you don't uh, achieve a, a correct learning curve, you can have a problem of leak, of course, especially in the beginning of experience. And uh, uh, the last aspect is that uh, uh, the leak depends also uh, from the patient, because when you operate a revision or surgery, for example, and you perform one anastomosis gastrovapas or another bariatric procedure, you can always uh, uh, have to consider this problem because it's a problematic, but uh, it's actual, it's currently during uh, a revision search. Okay, I, I mean, uh, uh, in case the case the leaks did happen, would that be uh, more difficult to treat compared with the leakage of the origin? Uh, this is true because uh, you have uh, two uh, afferent uh, small bowel limb mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and uh, the problem is uh, like in standard rule y gastric bypass, if you place a, a classic cylindrical uh, prosthesis, you uh, can uh, have a problem of migration. So what we used to do uh, in, when uh, we have uh, uh, some leaks uh, is to use a pigtail, endoscopic pigtail, like uh, in uh, a sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, but uh, the concern regard the size of the leak because uh, when, uh, if the, the orifice is too large, uh, you need to place not only one, but two or three peak dates. And of course, uh, the delay of healing is quite high. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I saw from your uh, video demonstration, it's very nice done. I, I, I really admire your technique. And I see you uh, always doing the single layer uh, hand sewing. So, have you ever uh, considered that? Sometimes we need to do a double layer with um, uh, cerebrovascular enhancement. Uh, you, have you ever done that? Uh, oh, thank you, Professor. This is a, a very nice uh, and detailed question. Um, the double layer is used by uh, ourselves, in especially, not, not always, but especially when we do, for example, revision or surgery because the tissue are more thicker than usual. And so you have quite enough space to do a mucomucosa layer. Right. Uh, uh, but, the pro uh, but I have to tell you sincerely that the problem you can account is uh, edema in the beginning of post-op okay. yeah. uh, with, uh, with some uh, functional stenosis. Okay, 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 thank you. <laughs> I, I, I mean, uh, this <clears throat> The second question from uh, Professor uh, Wei uh, was uh, uh, post-op uh, complications, especially nutritional complications. I want to give this question to Professor Safadi. Thank you very much. Uh, so like we heard today, most uh, of the studies, including the randomized prospective clinical trials, showed that there's more nutritional complications after OAGV but it's directly related to the length of the BP limb. Because in the E-Omega trial, the length of the BP limb in the RYGB was 50 centimeters compared to 200. So it really all depends on the, the BP limb. And I don't think it relates to whether you do one anastomosis or two. And that's where I think the randomized prospective clinical trial that uh, Professor Zeng's team is planning is crucial to answer that question. Uh, and I actually wanted to ask him because it wasn't clear in the discussion what the length of the BP limb is going to be in that study. So uh, that's my uh, answer to the question related to nutritional complications. 
Yeah, uh, uh, sorry, because uh, uh, like we know the uh, the uh, length of the beep limb sometimes determines the instance of, uh, you know, the iron deficiency anemia, because we know the iron almost absorbed in the upper section of the small bowel. So I, I wonder, uh, compared with RYGB, is the higher instance of anemia after OAGB? And yes, that's what the studies uh, at the Omega E Omega trial showed that there's high risk of iron deficiency. Correct. Okay. So, so then, what do we should do? <laughs> well, I think we should really define the optimal BP limb that will give us the combination of good weight loss and less nutritional complications. And I think whether you do one anastomosis or a Roux and Y, that ideal BP limb should be used. Uh, whether it's uh, a relative number, like whether we should measure the entire small bowel and let's say define 20%, 15%, 30%, whether it should be something standard like 150 centimeters. Uh, these are important questions. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough scientific data to answer them. Okay, thank you. Great. So, uh, so I... Uh, Professor Liu, uh, Yang Liu, you have any comments? Oui, oui. <coughs> hey, hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Yang Liu from Beijing French Hospital. Uh, I learned a lot from every speaker in this webinar. Uh, with, uh, in our center, we studied uh, this procedure, OEG procedure, in 2018. And uh, we learned this procedure from uh, Taiwan from uh, Professor Vijay Lee's center. Uh, until now, we have performed about uh, 150 cases uh, OEG procedure. Uh, uh, OEGB is also one is also very is uh, is one of the most favorite procedure. Uh, in our center, about uh, 20 percent uh, uh, of all the procedure is OEGB. It's, uh, usually we will we will perform OEGB for the diabetes patients and uh, the super obesity super obesity patients because uh, in OEGB uh, we usually make uh, longer BP limb than rule Y. Maybe this procedure can get better diabetes control uh, for the patients, especially for the low BMI, uh, low BMI because many. Uh, Many Chinese and uh, East Asia patients is low BMI. Uh, also for the super obesity, super obesity patients, uh, because the OEGB is much easier than RUI, uh, so this, this procedure is very s safe. Uh, in the reduced OEGB video uh, from the diaperia, uh, this is a very nice. Uh, very nice uh, procedure. Uh, I saw the uh, you didn't uh, suture the BP BP limb uh, uh, to the pouch uh, in a higher location uh, because in the uh, Carbaho OEGB procedure, uh, I think this step is uh, very important to avoid the bio bio reflux. Uh, 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 I want to know. My question is why you didn't do this step. Uh, in my case, is about uh, we have met uh, two cases, uh, very severe bio bio reflux cases, and one case we have uh, make a, uh, made a revision surgery uh, from OEGB to Y. Uh, uh, another question is I I saw you close the uh, suture close the piston space. Uh, because the OEGB procedure is uh, uh, only have one anastomosis, and the piston space is very large, so the interhernia rate is very low in this procedure. Uh, from the Vigilid's experience, he had may he had performed uh, two thousand cases, and he usually didn't uh, close the piston space for the routine step, and he never met internal hernia. So uh, my second question is, uh, will you try didn't uh, close the piston space? Thank you. Uh, 
I, I think this question for Dr. Uh, Giovanni. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the fir first question yeah. that uh, when you do the uh, G, GJ uh, anosmosis, the, for, for the OEGB, do you usually uh, suture, uh, suture the refer afferent limb higher to the gastric pouch to prevent uh, uh, bio reflux? That's the first thing. The second question he was mentioned that uh, for Peterson space, do you routinely close Peterson space uh, and the reason for that? Uh, okay, about uh, the first question about the reflux, the problem uh, is that uh, in a, uh, we try to place uh, uh, the arriving of the afferent limb correctly to the pouch in order to avoid too much reflux. Uh, uh, but uh, the, the question is that it's not only in, in terms of direction, but in terms in, in uh, how the reflux is so acid. So, uh, I mean, or, uh, or basic. I mean, uh, this depends on the length of the uh, biliary limb. And uh, uh, so the injury of Brex is uh, not in terms uh, uh, on the... Uh, uh, direction of the afferent limb because this is too much difficult to control how the liquid goes up into the pouch but is in terms of uh, how concentrated is the, uh, uh, the liquid arriving to this pouch and regarding the second question uh, yes routinely we close uh, the Peterson space uh, because like in other procedure especially in not, not, when, uh, not only when we have a, a, a BMI acceptable, but also in super, super obese patient, because the problem you have, as you know, is uh, uh, the problem of internal anemia. The problem of internal anemia is, uh, remains uh, currently difficult to be diagnosed because there are no exams explaining uh, this uh, disease uh, except in case of uh, early, uh, uh, I mean, uh, of emergency with an occlusion. And um, we uh, also had experience of, uh, unfortunately, uh, necrosis of the limb uh, due to a delayed arriving of uh, uh, the patient to emergency room. And so the patient was uh, uh, more, more than uh, one patient was operated by on occlusion with peritonitis due to uh, an incarcerated hernia and uh, delayed arrival of the patient in the hospital. And so with a resection, et cetera, and sometimes it's, it's really difficult to um, get the patient out of the sepsis. That's great. So uh, that's very nice. Uh, uh, I have another question for Professor Hui Liang. I, I mean, probably you have a different opinion about uh, OEGB. So what do you think, what's the future position of OEGB in the bariatric surgery field? Can you predict that? <laughs> uh, I think it's a very interesting <laughs> question. Uh, because we, uh, we all know that the gastric cancer uh, we should be concerned uh, after surgery, especially in the uh, OAGB. Now, we, we, we also uh, know that there are only one case is about the gastric cancer after the OAGB reported. But uh, maybe it's need a long time, uh, maybe showing that uh, uh, higher or low, uh, lower the prevalence of the gastric cancer after the OAGB. Um, so now I, I have only performed the only two cases of the OAGB. Uh, this is for the, uh, my, uh, for the uh, elderly uh, patients uh, for the diabetes. But I think uh, the OAGB compared to the RUI bypass, maybe the, uh, the OAGB is uh, simple, it's uh, safety, it's safe. And uh, maybe the OT uh, operating time maybe is uh, uh, shorter. Um, if uh, we have more and more the evidence about the 
uh, long-term outcomes, especially more than 10 years or 20 years, especially in Asian patients. Uh, but I believe more and more the OAGB uh, surgery will be performed in future, uh, especially in China mainland, because the VJ Li uh, said uh, it's simple, it's safe, so it will be welcome um, for the surgeon and it's also uh, for the patient because it's safe. So I think uh, this is a very good uh, procedure, um, but uh, I think uh, we should uh, to, uh, concern something about this uh, uh, surgery. Yes, uh, and I am I'm very pleased to join your uh, clinical study in future, uh, Charlie. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, we, we need more data to yes. convince everybody, yeah, either good data or, or bad data, but we need data. The data is going to tell everything. Yeah, I, think, so. you know, I have a comment on that, you know, Charlie and yeah. um, Professor Dian. Regarding, you know, you were absolutely right uh, regarding, you know, the absence of, 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 of clear data. Even when you talk about, during your presentation, you know, the retracted paper uh, by the Rito Barak at Gold, you know, I think we we must avoid to show this data because mm -hmm. it can be used and confusion, uh, you know, in the in the in the surgical community, not only in the surgical, but also in all the metabolic and bariatric community. We have to avoid to mention because it's going to be uh, deleterious from even the one anastomosic acid bypass, you know, because the data if you see closer uh, to the uh, data, you know. Uh, we cannot trust in this information because it's going to be absolutely unreal. But we are looking forward to having some news for your all the trial. I had a question for you, uh, Charles. Is regarding: uh, Are you thinking in in, in extending uh, the the one year uh, follow up time? Because uh, probably we will need, you know, to have more medium and long term results, more than one year. I mean. Uh, are you planning to think about that when you finish? It's too early to answer this question, I imagine. But what is your your concern or your comment uh, regarding this uh, limitation of a one year uh, follow up? Yeah, that's, this is a very good question. The the study for for primary endpoint going to be one year, so we want to have a quick shot. Then the, actually, this study going to going on for a long time. We're going to have three years, five years. 10 years, we keep, keep continue uh, follow up our patients. We're going to learn like a uh, STEMP trial. We have one year results, three year results, five year results. Hopefully we got a uh, long-term follow up. And I think that's very, very important because we have uh, 160 patients in each group. So, uh, and uh, I really, really look forward to the success of this study. And, uh, and also want to, yeah, yeah, everybody who are interested in just, uh, uh, or keep eye on our study and also give out give us some suggestions and also welcome centers from other countries to join this study. Yeah. I mean, uh, we cannot no, hear you. Uh, yeah. Mic is muted. Yeah. Sorry, you're, you're right. You're right. Uh, another question, Charles, is regarding, uh, you know, are you going to think in fixing? Uh, you know, the length of the biliary limb or it's going to be depending because it's going to be crucial, you know, to yeah. analyze this point. Yeah, I, we, we discuss a lot about uh, length of uh, uh, length of BP limb and also the length for ruin YGB length of BP versus ruin uh, limb. We had a lot of debate about that. So finally, we reached a consensus that we, we need to use the same specification as your mega trial and the stampy trial. So uh, we, we're going to use the two, still use 200 centimeter BP lamp for OEGB. And then for the ruin one GB, we use a 50 centimeter rule, uh, BP lamp and the 150 rule lamp. And uh, this result is going to comparable to Stampy trial and also going to comparable to the Yomega trial. If we use a different length of BP lamp, going to, we also, uh, you know, we, we, we in future, we, we cannot. Uh, compare different uh, randomized trial going to uh, make the uh, scientific value weaker. So that's our <laughs> our decision now. Interesting, interesting. 
Because no, no, I, I'm commenting that because one of the comments that you know, uh, Professor Chevalier and another, uh, you know, sergeants is saying that uh, sure in the in the uh, y omega trial, you know, the complication or the uh, adverse event of the um, one anastomosis that you passed was uh, or were due to the length of the biliopancreatic limb, 200 versus 50 in the Ruan White group. You know, you're going to be on the, the reason that are going to be affecting the result. But anyway, we will wait for that. Sorry for this interruption. Uh, uh, That's great. Let's, let, let's, let's continue with our discussion. Sir, Professor Lang, okay. uh, let, let's go, go ahead. With the next discussion, Professor Sam, go ahead. Yeah, the, I, I mean, probably he's busy. We, uh, yeah, probably he's busy, and then uh, we can uh, continue our discussion with, uh, when he's back. So uh, the other uh, the other question. So I want also want to uh, ask a question to all the all uh, to all the speakers and uh, our discussion. And uh, if you do OAGB, what's your patient selection criteria for OAGB? So, uh, who, who, Doctor, can, can I start okay. with that? Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, just out of disclosure, uh, I don't do a lot of OAGB, so it represents about 10% of what I do because I share everyone's concern about the biliary reflux, about the symptoms that patients complain of, about the steatorrhea, the hypoalbuminemia. So it's a procedure that's closer to a duodenal switch or malabsorptive procedure and requires a lot more maintenance. On the other hand, it's very effective if you have a super obese patient. So the BMI is more than 50, it's an excellent procedure. It's not only excellent because of the uh, excellent uh, weight loss, but it's really a much simpler to procedure to perform in a super obese patient. Uh, Rune Y gastric bypass can be difficult and challenging with a, in a super obese patient. So one criteria I use is the advanced BMI. And frequently, like I mentioned in my talk, it's a decision that I sometimes take interoperatively. So when I tell the patient we're going to do a gastric bypass, I will tell them it's most likely going to be a room wide gastric bypass. But if there's any difficulty in the operation, I want you to come out with the safest procedure. And in that case, I do an OAGB. Uh, so that's really what I do is I choose them for super obese patients or if I face any technical issues in trouble. Great. So what's your patient age consideration? Patient age? Uh, I prefer patients to be young uh, because uh, I, I'm, I worry a lot of the problems I faced with the OAGB were in elderly patients because they don't eat a lot of proteins, their maintenance is a bit more difficult. So I really worry about OAGB in the elderly. So I prefer to do it uh, in younger patients. I have a comment regarding uh, Professor Bassan said, you know, it's going to be very important. Uh, to be aware of this uh, technique, the one anastomosis gas bypass, just in case you find some um, uh, problem during your operation, especially malrotation. You know, when you have a, a non-discovered malrotated uh, bowel, you know, a, a very nice uh, uh, strategy is to uh, to change uh, from Ruan Y to one anastomosis gas bypass. It's going to be much more easier. That you know to perform a one way in a mal rotation uh, patient going to be a, a, a crazy idea. It's going to be a very important issue. And the other comment on the uh, Dr. Professor Bazen uh, word is regarding. I'm not concerned regarding the probably the the cancer after one anastomosis of the past. I am more concerned about. Uh, the complaining of the patient regarding their pillows are green the the morning uh, the morning after you know it just you know they are uh, complaining of, of symptoms there is no carcinogenesis probably not because we have a lot of information regarding that but we have not enough information regarding that the study we performed in Germany uh, comparing uh, uh, studies and one anastomosis gas bypass after failed sleep. Our main finding was that, that the patient after one anastomosis gas bypass complaining uh, from symptoms uh, with bile girl, bile reflux. 
you know, in terms of having bile in their mouths and in their pillows the, 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 the morning uh, after. More comments? Yeah. So what's your comment, also, Dr. Yang Liu? Uh, this is a very nice question. Also, it's uh, also a question confuses me because I uh, usually when que um, when patient ask me why you choose OEG before me, not the rule why. So I I also can explain very well to to them. Uh, from my experience, also I uh, I prefer OEGB to the patients. Uh, especially for the low BMI, uh, because from the data from Prof Professor Vijay Lee, in the low BMI, in the low BMI patient uh, uh, OEGB, uh, because uh, this procedure has longer BP limit, so maybe this procedure can get better diabetes control. Uh, also, the age is all, the uh, patient's age is uh, another Another way we, we should uh, con concern. Uh, also, uh, the bio reflux maybe maybe we introduce the uh, anastomosis uh, cancer uh, in the pouch. Maybe OEGB is uh, is is suitable for, for the uh, suitable for the patients. Uh, for the elder patients, maybe it's, it's better. And this is my opinion. Well, so nice. We have two different opinions. First, uh, uh, the professor uh, Yang Liu think the patient should be uh, BMI should be lower with type two diabetes, and uh, Professor Safadi think the BMI probably bigger. And the other regarding patient age, Professor Yang Liu think the elder should be better, but uh, Professor Safadi think the younger patient. Spider. So, what's your position, Dr. Depre? Yeah. Excuse me. So, you, you you would like to know my position about exactly your uh, for patient selection for patient selection for OEGB. Ah, okay. Um, so. Uh, for patient selection, uh, first, uh, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> your, your center, but in my center, sometimes the patient comes with a, a special request for a type of surgery. So uh, uh, they, they come in, in, the, in the office and they say, I would like to receive one uh, anastomosis gastric bypass, or I would like to receive a sleeve. Uh, I don't know if it, this happens also in Asia, but here in, in Belgium, sometimes uh, there are uh, these, uh, these events. So, uh, uh, why I say this? Because uh, uh, we, I all, always try to follow the suggestion of the patient, which means if the patient desires a, a, a bypass standard, or a mini bypass or a sleeve or switch, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, I see the preparative workup. And for example, uh, if I have a gastroesophageal reflux, I do not consider one anastomosis gastric bypass. If uh, I have a <coughs> high BMI, which means more than 50, I suggest uh, two steps. Uh, uh, procedure and uh, uh, so I start with a sleeve and then if the patient do not present a reflux I convert to a one anastomosis gastric bypass or if ever is a, 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 a reflux I convert to a and Y gastric bypass for example and so the main concern uh, in the decision in general, in the uh, background of different uh, procedures for obesity, are the presence of uh, a reflux or not, the presence of uh, high BMI or not, and then the other comorbidities like diabetes. But um, we see from the results that, for example, the, uh, uh, the different comorbidities 
are uh, with, with a different uh, procedure and weight loss especially are improved or resolved. All right, thank you. So uh, does anyone have other comments or questions? It's about five o'clock here in China. And, uh, <laughs> All right, so I, I give this uh, to Professor Torres for the conclusion yeah. and the closing remarks. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor. You know, uh, uh, I think uh, we have had, you know, a, a very, very uh, uh, outstanding meeting. Professor Sun, thank you very much for co-chairing uh, this uh, outstanding uh, session. I think that the topic, you know, that the, you know, the Academy ASARC uh, selected uh, is very appropriate. You know, the one anastomosis gas bypass is going to be uh, one of the most uh, performed procedure all over the world uh, from, you know, the West, from, I would say, California to the East, to Japan, you know, all over the world. You know, this procedure, look, we can see, you know, during uh, these, uh, the last years, the increasing number of this procedure all over the world. But nevertheless, there are uh, still some uh, concern and some uh, lack of information regarding uh, many, many issues regarding uh, this procedure. Uh, during this uh, meeting, we already faced with the uh, exciting comparison between, uh, you know, the two rivals. I mean, one anastomosis gas bypass versus one white gas bypass. Because, as uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Professor uh, um, Yu Liang showed us, you know, regarding the, the comparison between uh, a sleek gastrectomy and uh, uh, one anastomosis of the past is going to be the majority of uh, data uh, in favor of uh, the one anastomosis of the past. We compare a sleeve and one anastomosis of the past. It's going to be clear. So the, the most important information we are going to need is regarding, uh, you know, comparison between one Y and one anastomosis of the past, uh, especially regarding this bile girl. Uh, not only from the uh, carcinogenic point of view, but also from the uh, reflux point, point of view. So we are looking forward for having uh, news from Professor uh, Charles regarding this new uh, order trial. They are going to begin there. My only, you know, doubt regarding that is going to be maintaining the same lean, length length that the the E Omega trial in France, uh, 50 centimeter. Uh, from the u run y versus 200 uh, in the one anastomosis but, but we'll see if we can reproduce i agree with uh, uh, charles regarding the importance of of performing trial that can be comparable with the other with that issue again you know the absence of this data because the 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 risk of our uh, paper is going to be we have to retract them and also all the information that professor wei li updated recently is going to be a very important piece of information we have to take it into account the other issue apart from uh, the bile girl is uh, some comment you know some uh, speaker uh, commented regarding uh, especially some uh, discussion i think uh, you know, Professor uh, Wei Liu, you know, commented on the dumping syndrome and all these uh, hyperglycemic, hyperglycemic, this, uh, you know, this uh, uh, set of symptoms that the patient has because we don't have the pyrrhous protection uh, of the physiological uh, way of passing, uh, of, of passing the food of the patient. So this is another concern uh, regarding the dumping syndrome and this so uh, sometimes very challenging uh, situation that the patient uh, can be, uh, uh, have to be overcoming in the different ways. So, uh, I mean, you know, uh, summarizing, uh, you know, the meeting, I would say that the, this procedure is a very uh, uh, well uh, and widely performed procedure all over the world now. There are some, uh, uh, you know, concern or absence of clinical data uh, in some sense regarding, as uh, Professor 
uh, uh, Professor uh, San said, you know, the guy, the, the, the indication, the age, some people uh, select the younger, some others the eldest, the oldest, you know, um, regarding the BMI, but probably, you know, this uh, procedure, the one from the other past, we can put it in the middle between probably a sleep and uh, a standard adrenal switch, you know, the hypoabsorptive and the hypoabsorptive uh, component of the procedure is going to be uh, uh, important. And finally, I would like to uh, put on the table the, the necessity of having some more information regarding not counting the common channel in this hypersortive um, uh, uh, procedure. I think in some cases, uh, especially revisional for sure, uh, my advice would be uh, to count all the vowels just to know or to be informed about the length of the common channel, because if we don't know the length of the common channel and we do a 200 uh, billion functionality limb, we can have problems in, in those patients with the shorter length of the uh, total bowel. So we're going to be, we have been uh, reproduced, we have information regarding, regarding that. So I think it's a summary, you know, it's a very nice procedure, uh, a lot of information, uh, many, many uh, uh, clinical research ongoing, and I hope uh, guys to see each other face-to-face uh, -face next time and to share some more information about this so uh, challenging and uh, promising result of these new studies, especially, you know, I'm very happy to, to, to hear uh, about the order trial led by uh, uh, Professor uh, Charles. Okay, guys, I think, uh, Professor San, uh, do you want to, 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 to say goodbye to all the people? And uh, it's up to you. I want to, to, to give to you the word, the podium, uh, to close, uh, you know, this uh, outstanding, outstanding uh, uh, webinar. Professor San, please close the, the meeting. Thank you, Professor Torres. I give this opportunity to the representative from Easy Surge Medical, uh, Mr. Tarek. Thank you, Professor Torres, for this uh, excellent uh, closing remark. I would like to use uh, this opportunity to say a few words in the name of uh, Easy Search. First of all, um, about me. My name is Tarek, and I'm part of the international sales department at uh, Easy Search Medical. The first thing I'd like to do is uh, to give special thanks and appreciation to our chairman, the speakers, and the professors who took part in the panel discussion. It is really a great honor like, to have you, 10 well-known surgeons, with us here today. And uh, considering your rich experience and also your excellent reputation, only your contribution like, could be a guarantee to the success of this event. Thank you. And I would also like to thank everyone who took the time to join us here today. It uh, was a great pleasure to welcome those of you who have been with us in the last very successful academy, as well as those of you who are new to this event. And uh, if we look at the statistics of the last event, it becomes clear that uh, people all over the globe are watching us. And uh, in some regions, it's maybe middle in the night. In other regions, it's early in the morning. But today, we all came together with the same desire, the desire to learn and to educate ourselves. Therefore, I hope you all had an enjoyable and more important, highly educative event. And I hope uh, to see you soon in the next episode of our academy. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And again, thank you so much to all the speakers and the discussion for the high quality and high level of their information and their discussion. So guys, see you very soon. I hope okay. you have a nice day today and be safe, please. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. 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 See you soon offline. Absolutely. Bye-bye, Bye. Hi. Bye. 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 Take care. Bye.